right, we are back in the exhibit hall here at SGO, and I'm here with Dr. Adam Walter. Uh, Dr. Walter, where are you from, and uh, where are you in your training? I'm a third year resident at the University of Toledo College of Medicine and Life Sciences. You had the opportunity and the uh, privilege yesterday to be part of an educational forum here specifically focusing on the economic impacts of uh, treatments in gynecologic cancers. Can you tell us a little bit about what your objective was and what, what your uh, abstract that you were presenting? Sure. I, the, the project that I looked at was the role of bevacizumab or Avastin in the treatment of primary uh, adjuvant chemotherapy regimen studied in one of the large prospective GOG trials, 218. And um, looking at if we use that regimen for every woman that required primary adjuvant chemotherapy in the United States in a year's time, what would be the additional cost to the United States Medicare system? So m most patients with ovarian cancer um, typically fall in their sixth decade of life. Uh, and a large number of these women are going to be funded by the public sector, especially as our baby boomer population ages. Um, and over the past three, four years, as our gross domestic product has fallen, this has become even more critical um, because we're funding a larger and larger proportion uh, of these patients with public monies. So essentially we're treating larger and larger numbers of people on a fixed, fixed budget. Uh, so the goal was just really to look at if we use these re this regimen, which um, was not shown to be cost effective, but if we use this regimen, how would that impact how, how would that impact our United States Medicare system? And as a society, I think we have to look at that as a whole to see whether or not we can or cannot afford to offer some of these new therapies to patients that, that may have either limited, limited improvement in, in survival or even if they do have a, a significant improvement in survival, do they, do they justify the cost? When you start looking at some of these, what are some of the data that you are collecting about the general uh, cost of care of cancer as a whole, and then how that impacts uh, how you make, not so much decisions, but the de what's happening with the treatments, and especially the frontline treatments, the adjuvant treatments? I think frontline treatments are probably the easiest to identify because you have a more homogeneous patient population as far as what agents they've been exposed to, the level of surgery, and et cetera. Um, the first part of the question, talking a little bit about sort of the breakdown of who pays for what. Um, I think looking at uh, ASCO, they do a really nice job of breaking down exactly what cancer care costs and, and not exactly, not only exactly how much in dollar amounts, but what percentage is being paid by whom, which is going to be even more important Right now, more than 50% of, of all United States health care, including cancer care, is paid for by the private sector. Now, as expected, there were some, there's a lot, large numbers of varied projections, but most projections project that in the next six to eight years, half of our baby boomer population is going to be funded by the, by the public sector, and we're going to have less we're gonna have less and less people funding that public sector. So how do we, and they've sort of put a charge to, I think, clinicians to say, okay, uh, realizing that we're gonna be on a tighter budget going forward, how do we, how do we figure out strategies to make, to, to treat the most patients with the best therapy? At the end of the day, when you look at, at numbers, uh, obviously, we don't want to put a, a price tag on a month of life or two months of life, but we have to realize that there's a limited pool of money at some point, and when paying, paying with the public sector or the private sector, eventually the money runs out. Uh, as you were looking at the final conclusions of just this project, uh, what were some of your conclusions that uh, brought us? Uh, these, these are things and the questions we need to ask as we move forward to specifically uh, ovarian cancer treatment in this case. Right. I think... That's very true. I think it does, it's something that needs to be looked at. And I think you're right, it's difficult to put a price for any individual patient, um, especially especially, it's hard determining who that payer is going to be. I think there's lots of individual patients that 
you know, depending on their financial situation, they don't necessarily, they don't, they, they sort of fall either one way or the other outside of, outside of this norm or whatever we consider acceptable. I think, you know, we need to, not that it applies to every patient, but it's probably helpful to make some generalizations, to make some rough guidelines of what we believe is an acceptable monetary amount in treating patients, not only for the therapies that we currently use, but also, but to evaluate new therapies that come, come along to say up front, you know, what, what, uh, and, and I think it also helps drug companies in their development to say, okay, at, at such and such cost, this is how much survival benefit we're looking to get. You know, it, it just helps, it helps direct everything a little bit more. Awesome. Thank you very much, Dr. Walter. All right.